Good evening, church. How are you all? Good, good, good. Man, it's nice. It's like dry in here and warm in here. It's like we could just take a nap, but we're not going to take a nap. That would be very inappropriate for you, and even more inappropriate if I took a nap. So we are in our series. We're continuing days gone by. And man, I don't know about you, but I have really been enjoying this series. I've been enjoying walking it out. And, and man, we've had some really great messages. If you've missed any of them, they're all online, YouTube, our website, uh, the app, any, any of the directions you want to go and watch them, you can go back and watch those. They're going to be good. But this past weekend, we talked about heritage. We talked about family heritage. We talked about who you are and the, the identity that you have and the heritage that you get to be part of. That's not just the heritage of your own family, like your, your, your blood, like your mom and your grandma and all that kind of stuff. Not just that, but we talked about the heritage that we have through Christ, of being adopted into the family, and what it means when we get to walk into a heritage and the faith that we get to stand on and the stories that we get to stand on. And you know, the thing I want to kind of, I kind of talk more a little bit tonight about that concept of heritage, but, but look at it from a different perspective uh, and look at it from the perspective of faith. You know, faith is something that's an interesting word. We, we use it a lot. We talk about it a lot. Uh, and, you know, sometimes maybe you've even had that word thrown in your face in, in what was supposed to be an encouraging way, but it was actually a negative way. Like, oh, I guess you just didn't have enough faith. Oh, well, if you had more faith, maybe, maybe God would have, would have shown up. If you had just a little more faith, but, you know, you were close. So maybe you've had a, a negative faith experience where someone has, has used that. Maybe that's even become a, like, oh, man, I, I, don't, I don't like that word because it, it produces a, a feeling of lack. Because sometimes I've understood that if there's something that's wrong or something that's missing or something that's not perfect, it's because I was lacking faith. And, and the good news I have for you today, and we're going to look at this, is that's not true. You don't have to have everything perfect in your world to still have faith. You, everything in your world doesn't have to be put together to have faith. Everything in your world doesn't have to be like, oh, I'm just a, the pure and spotless lamb ready to, to be presented to the world. That's not who you have to have to be faith. And in fact, it's in the times when things aren't going well where sometimes we need faith the most. And you know, faith is pretty, it, it, it's, it's, it's a pretty simple concept. But we'll look at a couple of definitions of faith. But you know, having faith in God is really believing two things. It's believing, one, that God, the creator of the universe, the creator of heaven and earth, the one who is powerful, that he has the ability to do something for, in your situation. So, for example, you're sick, and you say, man, i got to have faith that God can heal me. And so you have to ask yourself two parts. One, is he able to do it? Do I believe that God is able to do it? And a lot of times, most times, at least if you're a believer, if you believe in God, then you probably believe that the person who spoke the world into existence from nothing could heal your headache. So that's usually not the most doubted part of faith. But there's a second part that's very difficult. And I've struggled with it and will continue to struggle with this, this concept because it takes reminder after reminder after reminder because faith comes by hearing and hearing the word of Christ over and over again. But the second part is that, yeah, okay, so God is able, but is God willing to do it for me? And that's where the enemy likes to come in. And he'll say, yeah, God could do it, but why would he do it for you? Why would he change your financial situation? Why would he restore that relationship? Why would he touch your body? He knows what you've done. And so your faith is dwindled and your belief that God is willing is removed. And then it's easy to get down on yourself and believing that God could do it, but he won't do it for me. 
because of my decisions in my life, because of my past, because of my lack. Maybe not even your past, maybe because of what you're currently in right now, today. Because as much as I'd love to believe that every person who's in this room is perfect, I'm not. So at least one of us is broken. And since I know I'm probably not the only one, then we're going to look at a little section of scripture that I think will encourage us tonight. And if you grew up in a Christian school or a Christian home, then this was a really famous chapter. That's Hebrews 11, the faith chapter. The hall of faith. The heroes of faith. If you could get in this chapter, you were in. This was it. This was the epitome of greatness, what you could achieve in the Bible. And I'm going to read a good chunk of it. And it's, gonna be, it's, it's a long chunk of it, but I think it's important that we read it. It's long. And we'll take little breaks probably here or there. But they give an interesting definition of faith right off the bat. Remember, this is from the book of Hebrews 11. No one is for sure who the author of Hebrews is. It's a highly debated subject among people who have many leather-bound books and sit in rooms discussing things passionately. <laughs> I don't know who wrote it. You know why? Because they didn't put their name on it. So I don't know. So, you know, you can have your theories, but that's all they are. We don't know. So here it is. Faith shows the reality of what we hope for. It is the evidence of the things we cannot see. Just that is kind of weird. Faith shows the reality of what we hope for. It's the evidence of things we can't see. You know, faith goes in and shows you what exactly you're believing for. Because sometimes we need to take a stand and actually say what it is we're believing for. What is it actually that I want? Sometimes that's easier said than done. If you've watched any good genie movie, you know that three wishes can sometimes really get you in trouble. I've been watching DuckTales with my kids. That messed me up. <laughs> Faith shows the reality. of what Because if you believe something, then you're going to be walking in that direction. You're going to be walking towards it. When I'm hungry and I believe that there is food downstairs and I have faith that it is there, I will walk in that direction hoping that that faith turns into the reality of what I'm hoping for. And sometimes I'm disappointed because my kids ate it all. It's the evidence of things we can't see. That's a big part of faith. And it actually describes this a little bit more. It says, through their faith, the people in the days of old earned a good reputation. By faith, we understand that the entire universe was formed at God's command. That what we now see did not come from anything that could be seen. They just throw that in there like, just believe it. Just believe that creation is 100% true. You never saw it. You'll never get to see it. And that's what faith is. The things you don't get to see. Jesus talked about when he was talking to Thomas, you know, old doubting Thomas. And he said, man, it's a good thing that you believe. But how much better the people who believe who will never see? How much better than poor doubting Thomas? It was by faith that Abel brought a more acceptable offering to God than Cain did. Abel's offering gave evidence that he was a righteous man and God showed his approval of his gifts. Although Abel is long dead, he still speaks to us by his example of faith. 
It was by faith that Enoch was taken up to heaven without dying. He disappeared because God took him. For before he was taken up, he was known as a person who pleased God. Anytime I think I'm getting really good with God, I just remind myself, you haven't pleased him enough to just take you up. You, you, that's a pretty impressive, like you're just walking and God's like, you know what? You're just coming with me today. <laughs> We're so tight. Just come on. Just come on up. You made it, Enoch. Only one. Come on up. So if I ever need to be humble, that's all I got to do is look at Enoch. And it is impossible to please God without faith. Anyone who wants to come to him must believe that God exists and that he rewards those who sincerely seek him. It was by faith that Noah built a large boat to save his family from the flood. He obeyed God who warned him about things that he had never, that had never happened before. By faith, by his faith, Noah condemned the rest of the world and he received the righteousness that comes by faith. You know, before the flood, it had never rained. So when God said that water was going to come to the earth and water was going to come from the sky and water was going to come from the flood, he didn't know the, it says that the, the earth at the time was watered by the firmament. There was a heavy mist, a heavy dew that fell every day. There was no rain. God's like, it's going to rain. Build a boat. <laughs> Couldn't see it. Didn't know what it was. Didn't even exist. Face the evidence of things not seen. It was by faith that Abraham obeyed when God called him to leave home and to go to another land that God would give him as an inheritance. He went without knowing where he was going, and even when he reached the land God promised him, he lived there by faith, for he was like a foreigner living in tents. And so did Isaac and Jacob, who inherited the same promise. Abraham was confidently looking forward to a city with eternal foundations, a city designed and built by God. It was by faith that even Sarah was able to have children, though she was barren and was too old. She believed that would God would keep his promise, and so a whole nation came from this one man who was as good as dead. A nation with so many people that like the stars in the sky and the sand on the seashores, there is no way to count them. All these people die still believing what God had promised them. All these people died still believing what God had promised them. They did not receive what was promised, but they saw it from a distance and welcomed it. They agreed that they were foreigners and nomads here on earth. Obviously, people who say such things are looking forward to a country they can call their own. But they were looking for a better place, a heavenly homeland. That is why God is not ashamed to be called their God, for he has prepared a city for them. If they had longed for the country they came from, they could have gone back. It was by faith that Abraham offered Isaac as a sacrifice when God was testing him. Abraham had received God's promise, was ready to sacrifice his only son, Isaac, even though God told him, Isaac is the son through whom your descendants will be counted. Abraham reasoned that if Isaac died, God was able to bring him back to life again. And in a sense, Abraham did receive his son back from the dead. It was by faith that Isaac promised the blessing for the future of his sons, Jacob and Esau. It was by faith that Jacob, when he was old and dying, blessed each of Joseph's sons and bowed in worship as he leaned on his staff. It was by faith that Joseph, when he was about to die, said confidently that the people of Israel would leave Egypt. He even commanded them to take his bones with them when they left. It was by faith that Moses' parents hid him for three months when he was born. They saw that God had given them an unusual child, and they were not afraid to disobey the king's command. It was by faith that Moses, when he grew up, refused to be called the son of a pharaoh's daughter. He chose to share the oppression of God's people instead of enjoying the fleeting pleasures of sin. He thought it was better to suffer for the sake of Christ than to own the treasure of Egypt, for he was looking ahead to his great reward. 
It was by faith that Moses left the land of Egypt, not fearing the king's anger. He kept right on going because he kept his eyes on the one who's invisible. It was by faith that Moses commanded the people of Israel to keep the Passover and sprinkle the blood on the doorstep so the angel of death would not kill their firstborn son. It was by faith that the people of Israel went right through the Red Sea as though they were on dry ground. But when the Egyptians tried to follow, they were drowned. It was by faith that the people of Israel marched around Jericho for seven days and the walls came crashing down. It was by faith that Rahab the prostitute was not destroyed with the people in her city who refused to obey God, for she had given a friendly welcome to the spies. How much more do I need to say? It would take too long to recount the stories of faith of Gideon, Barak, Samson, Japheth, David, Samuel, and all the prophets. This is where I want to stop for a second. Something that struck me in this chapter is who we stop telling a story about. Because we're going through this story and we're telling all these stories of these people and we're giving the highlight reel. All the way back to Abel. And then all of a sudden we say, oh, but now I don't have time to talk about Gideon or Samson or David, the greatest king ever, or all of the prophets. I don't have time to talk about them. But I do have time to tell you about Rahab, the prostitute, who let people in and hid the spies in the city. She is a hero of faith. Now, that'll mess with a little bit of your theology, because Rahab was not a delivered prostitute when the, Jerusalem, when the this Israeli spies came. She was an active prostitute in Jericho, living that life. And in hiding the spies, her entire ruse, well, she just lied. Bold-faced. You know, she was probably used to hiding men. Probably wasn't her first time. She knew right where to take them where they wouldn't be found. And she was presented with a chance to turn them in and instead she hid them. And then when asked about it, she lied. And she just completely lied. Not, not a lie of omission, a bold face lie. They went that way. Hurry, if you leave now, you can catch them. They were here. They did their business. And then they left. The entire thing was a lie. She was living a life of sin in the midst of a people who are not God's people. And then when faced with a question, she lied. And the lie resulted in saving the lives of the spies. You know, Joshua was in the hall of faith. He sent the spies. He walked around Jericho. And Rahab talked to these guys. And in the story, she told them, I know that God's given you this land. We've known it, and I've known it since I heard the story 40 years before when you crossed the Red Sea. When I heard God that was with you and that he was faithful to you, that he led you by the day and he led you by the night and he provided food and the wilderness. We've heard the story and I believe in him. And God used her. God had a purpose for her. And the thing that stood out to me is that God had a purpose for her and she was able to display great faith while she was still messed up. She was still a prostitute. Her redemption didn't come till later. She was Rahab the prostitute, and when they came in, they hung the scarlet fabric, the scarlet cord from the window. And that's who she was. 
And even in recording her name, it says Rahab the prostitute. She was Rahab the prostitute in the Old Testament. She's actually Rahab the prostitute two times in the New Testament. But both times, she's listed as a faithful woman. As a one who believed. And the reason is, for whatever reason, she believed that not only was the God who let the Israelites cross the Red Sea on dry ground able to save her, for some reason she got in her mind he was willing to. And even in the midst of her dysfunction and doing what only came natural, which was hiding and lying, God still made a way for her to be redeemed. Do you know that God will still make a way for you to be redeemed even in the middle of your dysfunction? Even in the middle of your ugly identity? Even in the middle of what you're walking through right now? The heartache that you're going through, the frustration, the disappointment that he's willing to meet you right there? call something out. And you know, I mentioned this before because she is redeemed. She does get married to the son of the leader of Judah. She does have a son named Boaz. She is in the lineage of David and Jesus. But they keep a tradition in this New Testament writing that maybe seems harsh because she's still Rahab the prostitute. And we have doubting Thomas and the woman with the issue of blood and Matthew, the tax collector. And poor Zacchaeus, the wee little man And I ask myself, if God was in the redeeming business, then why does he keep identifying the dysfunction? Why does he keep identifying the shortcoming? Why does he keep identifying the sin? Why is the only person who decided to label themselves something good, John? The beloved. When Matthew had the same opportunity and instead he labeled himself Matthew the tax collector, which in the Jewish eyes was the most disgusting, filthy, lowest scum on the face of the planet. Tax collectors were not allowed to go and worship in the synagogue, but even prostitutes were. And poor Rahab still has this identity. But you know, that's not what Boaz called her. But God has a way of being able to show something in his word that should speak to your hearts. It's okay to realize that you have something in your life that you need to be delivered from. And maybe that thing that needs to be delivered is something that connects you with a heritage that people can understand. Because you see, if the Bible was only filled with characters who were perfect people, who would understand that? If the only thing the word recorded was the perfection of these people, then they would be figures that could never be attained. But Matthew himself says, I was Matthew the tax collector. And Jesus loved me. And he saved me. And he forgave me. And he healed me. 
and he restored me, and he gave me a new identity in Christ, and that's who I am. But I'm never afraid to remember who I was because if who I was can help me connect you with who you are now, I'll tell you about how when I was a tax collector. Rahab would tell you about when she was a prostitute. Thomas could tell you when he doubted. That woman with the issue of blood could say, yeah, I did have the issue of blood, but that's not who I am anymore. But if it helps me connect you to where you're at right now, to where God wants to be, then that story is good because it builds your faith. You see, every one of these people in the faith chapter had someone or something, an event that they could look at. Even Abel got to hear the stories of when God used to walk with mom and dad in the garden. And he's faithful. Yeah, they messed up. They fell. But God's good. And he still deserves my best. And the one who was considered faithful was the one who was killed. But every one of these stories had someone that they got to see. And they got to connect with their failure as well as their success. Because maybe Rahab said, you know, we heard about you 40 years ago. And if Israel would have just came right in, I probably wouldn't have had a chance. But I figure if you could sit there for 40 years and doubt God, and he still gets you to the other side, then maybe he'd save me. Because if he saved you, a bunch of people who wouldn't even trust God when he was right in front of you, then maybe he'll save me. And you see, sometimes we're afraid to let who we were be known because we're afraid what other people think about us. We'll be afraid that our past and the heritage that we created in our own lives disqualifies us from the relationships that we want now. And we think that that defining factor is what disqualifies us from a future of good in relationships with people. So we hide it and we're embarrassed by it and we pretend it didn't exist. But your mess up, your setback, your failure is the greatest story of God's love ever because you're here today. And it results in seeing that you in faith are walking out today. And it doesn't matter that you're not perfect today. God doesn't need perfection. He needs faith. How we get faith? Well, Hebrews 12 says that we do this by keeping our eyes on Jesus, the one who initiates and perfects our faith. That when we look at ourselves and we say, we're in a place that I cannot walk out. We can look to the Savior and he can say, I can work on your disbelief. I can create faith inside of you. I can initiate a belief that there is something that happened because something happened to Rahab and something initiated faith inside of her. Something showed up that would allow a prostitute to believe that she could be saved. God has something for us, church. Do you realize that I love the part in this story? It says, Abel's offering gave evidence that he was a righteous man. And God showed his approval of his gifts Although Abel is long dead, he still speaks to us by his example of faith. Although Abel is long dead, his example still speaks to us by faith. Although Rahab the prostitute is long dead, her faith still is an example. Although Matthew the tax collector is long dead, his faith still produces something in our life. And you know what? We have Jesus. And the old you, the pre-Jesus you, 
the sinner you, the sin inside of you was crucified with Christ and you are raised as a new man, a new woman. And you know what? Although that person may be dead, the story of God's faithfulness and how he delivered from you lives on today and it shares and it gives an example of the goodness of God and it still encourages the brethren. It still encourages the fact that God is faithful even when you are faithless. That even when you try to run away, God shows up. You know, I love when Hebrew 12, it continues to talk about, and it's actually quoting the Old Testament, but it says, don't forget that God disciplines those who he loves. God corrects those who he loves. But the, the Passion Translation actually talks about, it says that in the process, he gets you and he draws you close to him. You know, a lot of times when we grew up, discipline was a punishment. Discipline was pain. Discipline was receiving something. I, I don't know how you grew up, but if I got disciplined, it was at the end of a, of a rod or a switch. That was what my discipline was. But God said in the part of correcting, because he loves you, it says the best way for him to get a corrective action and result in your life is for him to draw you closer. And so here's the thing. God is taking his people and he's drawing you closer. When he sees you messing up, when he sees you living in something that is not supposed to be the best thing because he loves you, because of the covenant with you, he draws you closer. He comes in and he grabs you. But here's, here's an issue. Sometimes, and maybe if you've had kids, you've had this experience. Felix is five months old. And sometimes he just... He just doesn't want to be held. And if you've ever had even a five-month-old who weighs nothing that doesn't want to be hold, held, they can make that really complicated. And you can try to draw him closer and he will arch his back and he will throw his head back and he will rile around. But here's the thing. I'm his father. I'm not going to let him go. That may be what he thinks he wants for me to let him go, but I'm not going to let him go. I'm not doing anything to hurt. Now, he, I always get worried. Like, I'm afraid he's like, if I did that to my neck, I'd be out for three weeks. But sometimes God is trying to, he sees something in your life and he says, oh man, this isn't good for you. You know, the best way to live like me is if you smell like me. And if you get close to me, you're gonna, I'm going to rub off on you. And I'm just going to draw you close. And in the process of drawing us close, we decide, I don't want to be told what to do. I don't want this correction. I like what I'm doing. And we begin to flail ourselves around and the only person that's hurting us is ourself. But God's not letting go because he's faithful to the faithless. Because the dysfunction that's in your life, although it may be a title that someone remembers you by now and you're ashamed of, you shouldn't be ashamed anymore. Because the more often that he grabs you and he draws you close, the more you begin to smell like him. The more you begin to act like him. The more you begin to hear his heartbeat, to see his breath, to walk in his rhythm, and to realize that he's not drawing me close because he's angry at me. He's drawing me close because he loves me. Rahab realized that God wanted to draw her close. And that's the greatest mystery. I don't know what got a hold of her. But the result was great faith. 
And you know, the good news is today that all the Bible tells you and it connects you with the dysfunction. When we get to heaven, if you ask to visit Rahab the prostitute, she won't be found. She's not here. Not in heaven. I think you just mean Rahab the righteous. The one who is justified by faith. The one who had great faith. Is that the Rahab you're talking about? Because she's here. But that other title was only for the works in progress. We've reached perfection here. But as long as we're works in progress, we can't be ashamed of our past. Because the fact that I'm here today is only the picture of God's goodness. It's only the picture of God's faithfulness. It's only the picture of a God who has a plan, whose calling is without repentance, who believes in you more than ever. And even when you try to run away, he only draws you closer. And he'll hold on. And he won't let go. Because he said, I'll never leave you or forsake you. And when we get to the point where we feel like our faith is weak and our faith is limited, the greatest thing we can do is remember that faith comes by hearing and hearing about Jesus and hearing about Christ and hearing about a God who loves us. You know, it says that Moses was willing to sacrifice for Christ. But Christ wasn't here yet. But he could see it. Feel it. He was drawn close to something and he knew it was there. 